Do you know the difference between a uterus and a cervix and the ovaries? And what are the different functions of these organs? If you don't, don't feel too bad because today we're going to be changing all that. Hi everyone, it's Dr. Nabila Noor, board certified and fellowship trained urogynecologist and a pelvic reconstructive surgeon. Welcome back to the channel. Here we talk about everything pelvic health. So if you're new to the channel and like what you see, don't forget to subscribe and share it with a friend. Now, one of my favorite things when I see my patients in the clinic for the first time is that I love showing them pictures of what is normal anatomy. We go over the different female body parts, both external and internal, and then I tell them what the functions of each of these organs are, and then we talk about their pathology and how some of the treatment options, whether non-surgical or surgical, will fix their anatomy. Now, majority of the times when I do that, patients look at me shocked that this is the first time somebody has actually explained to them what the different female body parts are and what the functions are. And to me, as a physician, as a surgeon who does this on a daily basis, it's surprising because how are we expecting our patients to understand complex surgeries if they don't even understand basic anatomy what's normal versus abnormal. So I take it very seriously that we as physicians, and especially as surgeons, the onus is on us to help educate women about their anatomy, about their body parts, because if they are familiar about their body, only then can they make an informed decision. And truth be told, it actually makes the discussion with the patients a lot easier because we can have a conversation where I'm trying to understand what are some of the concerns they have, and they have a better understanding of why I'm suggesting certain procedures, and we can really have an educated, knowledgeable conversation and come up with a plan that works best for each individual patient. So in my next few videos, I wanna talk about Female Anatomy 101. Now I wanna break it down to multiple different episodes because I don't wanna overwhelm you with too much information in one video, because it is a lot. So today will be the part one of this anatomy series. We'll talk about internal female organs. We'll go over the different parts. We'll talk about why each organ is important, what their function is. And then I'll finish by talking about a very common surgery that we often do on females, which is a hysterectomy. And we'll talk about what that involves and debunk some of the common myths that women have about a hysterectomy. So without further ado, let's get started. In today's video, we're going to be discussing the internal female organs or the female reproductive parts, essentially. So in this schematic right here, you can see all the internal female organs. So this structure right here is the uterus, which is shaped like a pear, and the tip of the uterus is known as the cervix. This is a muscular organ, and it's important because this is where a baby grows during pregnancy. The tip of the uterus is known as the cervix, and as you can see right in the middle, there is a little opening known as the cervical opening. Now the cervix is important because this is essentially the tip of the uterus, and also during labor, when women's having a vaginal delivery, when your doctor, when your OBGYN doctor checks vaginally to see how far you're dilated, they're essentially checking how open the cervix is. Because remember, we said that the baby grows inside the uterus during pregnancy, and during the process of labor, the baby's head essentially passed through the cervix. So the cervix has to dilate or open up for the baby to be able to be delivered. Next to the cervix is the vaginal canal. The vagina is essentially this tubular organ, and as you can see, there are lots of folds in the vagina known as the rugae. The rugae allows the vagina to stretch, especially as needed during intercourse or during vaginal delivery. The stretching of the vaginal wall enables the baby's body and head to be accommodated accordingly during delivery. Going back to the uterus, as I mentioned, the uterus is a muscular organ. The muscles of the uterus is known as the myometrium, but the inside lining of the uterus is known as the endometrium. Now, every month when females are having menses or their periods, the inside lining of the uterus, so that endometrial lining, sheds, and that's essentially what a period is. When menopause happens, which for most women is around the average age of 51, it essentially means that there's no shedding of the uterine lining for more than 12 months. And that's when that endometrial lining gets very, very thin. If there's ever a situation where a postmenopausal woman notices vaginal bleeding, it's very important to make sure you go see an OBGYN so we can do an ultrasound to take a look at the uterus and take a look at that endometrial lining to make sure that it's not thick. Because as mentioned, in a menopausal female, that endometrial lining should be very thin. And if it is thick, 
that means that that could be the reason why they're having bleeding and it's absolutely necessary to do an endometrial biopsy to make sure that there's nothing concerning in there, meaning that we rule out cancer or endometrial cancer. Arising from the uterus on both sides are these tubular structures, and these are known as the fallopian tube. The distal portion of the fallopian tube, as you can see here, has these finger-like or flower-like projections. This is known as the fimbria. So the fimbria is important because it helps guide the egg that is released by the ovaries into the fallopian tube and then guide it into the uterus. So these circular structures are known as ovaries, which is very important because they release hormones, which is what causes the menstrual cycle to function appropriately. And it also releases an egg every month during ovulation. And it's that egg which essentially travels through the fallopian tube, gets into the uterus. And if in this process it comes in contact with the sperm, then fertilization can happen. And that fertilized egg, if embeds into the walls of the uterus, that is known as implantation, then that is the start of a pregnancy. So during intercourse, if ejaculation happens and there's a sperm released, the sperm is essentially released into the vaginal canal and that can travel through the cervical opening right here through the uterus and also travel into the tube. Majority of the times fertilization happens in the tube and then that fertilized egg can travel back into the uterus and get stuck or implanted into the walls of the uterus and that is essentially the start of a pregnancy as I mentioned before. Now, when we're talking about a hysterectomy, which is one of the most common surgeries that's performed in females, essentially what that means is removal of the uterus, which is this structure right here. So if you come to the schematic right here, so this portion that's grayed out a little bit, that's the uterus and the cervix. So if we're talking about performing a hysterectomy, we're essentially cutting the, we're essentially separating the uterus from all its attachments. So we, we essentially cut through all the attachments on this side, all the attachments in this side. Here, the uterus and the cervix is attached to the vagina. We essentially cut through this particular area right here. And once this is separated, we remove it through the vaginal canal and out through the body. Now, this is a traditional hysterectomy. Now, a lot of the times patients come to my office and they say that they have had a partial hysterectomy. Now, partial hysterectomy is a very vague term because it doesn't quite explain what organ was removed. For a lot of patients, when they say partial hysterectomy, they mean that the tubes and the ovaries were left behind and only the uterus was removed. Whereas I've had patients who, when they say partial hysterectomy, what they really mean is the uterus was removed, but the cervix, which is essentially the tip of the uterus, was left behind. The more appropriate term to describe a hysterectomy is either a total hysterectomy or a supracervical hysterectomy. So a total hysterectomy is when you remove the whole uterus and the cervix. And then because everything is removed from here, there's essentially a hole here so we can remove the specimen through the vagina, then essentially we sew the vaginal canal right here. The other way of doing hysterectomy is a supracervical hysterectomy, which means it's a hysterectomy right above the cervix. The cervix, remember this drawing, it's just the tip of the uterus, so this portion right here. So when we do a supracervical hysterectomy, essentially what we're doing is we excising the uterus from all the lateral attachments, but we also leave the cervix behind and we actually cut through the uterus right here and then remove only the top portion of the uterus. So that's known as the supracervical hysterectomy. And because the cervix is still present, you cannot remove the uterus through the vagina. So in these cases, we have to remove the uterus through an incision on their abdominal wall, usually through the belly button or right around it. It's very important to understand that removing the uterus has no effect on a woman's hormonal status. A lot of the times women are concerned that by removing the uterus, they're going to go into menopause. What is true is that after removing a uterus, they're not going to bleed anymore because remember we discussed that menses or menstruation happens when the inside lining of the uterus sheds. That's what causes the bleeding. So after a hysterectomy, since there's no uterus, there's no more bleeding. But as long as the woman still has an ovary, they still go through the hormonal cycles. Even though they're not going to bleed on a monthly basis, they're still going to go through the hormonal cycle, so they're not going to be in menopause because the menstrual cycle is still going to be active. 
Now, if you had a hysterectomy and at the time of your hysterectomy, your physicians also removed your ovaries, then yes, then you do go into menopause because now not only are you not going to bleed, but because there's no ovaries, you're not going to have release of the hormones that the ovaries produce and you're not going to go through the hormonal cycle. If you're somebody who has not gone through menopause, but you need a hysterectomy, your surgeon will most likely just remove the uterus, but not remove the ovaries. Because like I said, there is benefits to keeping the ovaries. Recently, we also have data that shows that even after menopause, there's still some benefit in keeping the ovaries up until age 65. For me, for example, when I'm doing a hysterectomy on somebody who may be menopausal, but they're below the age of 65, unless the ovaries look abnormal and there's anything concerning, I actually leave the ovaries behind. A lot of the times, we as surgeons will recommend, especially for a woman that's going through hysterectomy, is to remove the fallopian tube. And the reason for that is, you know, once you're done with childbearing, there's really no purpose for the fallopian tube. Sometimes the distal part of the fallopian tube, so this fimbriated portion, can develop cancer. So when we're doing a hysterectomy, majority of the times we'll also remove the tubes along with it because there's really no purpose for the tubes without the uterus and removing the tubes reduces your risk of developing fallopian tube cancer. For women who are above the age of 65, there's really no benefit to keeping the ovaries. So when I'm counseling a patient for a hysterectomy after the age of 65, I usually recommend removing the uterus, the tubes, as well as the ovaries, because removing the ovaries reduces their risk of developing ovarian cancer. To summarize, when we're talking about a hysterectomy alone, what we're doing is removing the uterus and the cervix. Removing the uterus has no effect in a woman's hormonal status as long as the ovaries are present. And usually, if we have a premenopausal patient or a patient who is less than the age of 65, unless there is any concerns or abnormality in the ovaries, most surgeons will leave the ovaries behind. The fallopian tube, though, will usually come out with the uterus because, again, removing the fallopian tube can reduce their risk of developing fallopian tube cancer. Really, the main purpose of the fallopian tube is to aid in pregnancy. When we're removing the uterus, there's really not much role for the fallopian tube to be there. So that was our first part of discussing the female anatomy. Hope you found that video helpful, and if you did, don't forget to subscribe and share it with a friend. You can also sign up for my newsletter, the link of which will be down below. And I'll be back next week with part two of discussing the female anatomy. Hope to see you soon. Bye.